Thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, this is actually a California bar exam on uh, that covers the area that I'm I'm covering with the EBER review, and it's also covering negligence as well for torts. So I'm going to take a real California bar question. I'm going to read it. It's from the 2010 July California Bar, and um, it's a released answer in question. And it's question number one. I'm not going to read these instructions or anything. And uh, this is, was the lineup back then. So you know, I've been I've been doing some of these multiple choice questions, and. Um, <clears throat> Back in 2010, they were having a three-day exam. Now they're having a two-day. But anyway, let's have a look at this question because it's really relevant to torts. But when you first read it, you might think, hey, this could be a criminal law, you know. So, uh, basically, this will happen. This is the first question. You're going to be nervous, right? So... You might want to jump to the bottom before you read through the whole fact pattern. It says, under what theory or theories, if any, might Patron bring an action for damages against homeowner, burglar, or cinema? Discuss. So right there, you're looking at the call of the question. Before you read the fact pattern, and you're going to notice that it's saying what theory or theories, and it's a person bringing it against another which would be a civil case right damages i'm thinking torts right okay so homeowner kept a handgun on his bedside table in order to protect himself against intruders a statute provides that all firearms must be stored in a secure container that is fully enclosed and locked burglar broke into homeowner's house while homeowner was out and stole the handgun. Burglar subsequently used the handgun in an attack on patron in a parking lot belonging to cinema. Patron just had exited cinema around midnight after viewing a late movie. During the attack, burglar approached patron and demanded that she hand over her purse. Patron refused. Burglar drew the handgun and pointed it at the patron and stated, You made me so mad. Now I'm going to shoot you. <gasps> patron fainted out of shock and suffered a concussion. Burglar took her purse and fled, but was later apprehended by the police. Cinema had been aware of several previous attacks on its customers in the parking lot at night during the past several years but provided no lighting or security guard. Under what theory or theories, if any, might Patron begin to bring an action for damages against homeowner burglar cinema discuss? Okay, now, you can pause the video and do a practice essay and then stop it right here, but I'm gonna roll to the first mo model answer and then maybe we'll take a peek at the second one as well. Okay, so it's up to you. Now, answer A to question one. Patron versus homeowner. The issue is under what theories P might bring in an action against H. Okay. Negligence. Negligence is an action where a plaintiff asserts that a defendant breached a duty and cause damages in order to prevail on a claim of negligence, the plaintiff must prove, prove duty breach, actual causation, proximate causation, and damages. Okay. I think I could do better. Okay. One, duty. Duty determines the level of care a defendant must exercise. Everyone owes a general duty to avoid harming others. In certain circumstances, an individual owes a duty owes a higher duty of care. Under Car Car the Cardoza majority test, the duty is owed to those in the zone of danger, meaning 
those in the vicinity who may be harmed by the action under the Andrews Minority Test, the duty is owed to all foreseeable plaintiffs. Applying the Cardozo test, H will claim that he did not have a duty to do to P because she was not in his home when the event occurred. Under the Andrews test, P will claim that he H did owe a duty because it was foreseeable someone could use the firearm to go out and shoot someone or injure someone or put someone in fear as B did in this case depending on where H lives and whether it is a community where burglaries often occur P may succeed in showing it was foreseeable that a burglar could come in and take a handgun nothing personal but I cannot stand these abbreviated names P H and B but Evidently, their model answers often use them. The court will likely agree with P because it was foreseeable the gun could be used on a person, so H owed a duty to P. Now, let me say something briefly. Before you write your essay, uh, you have to go through it really fast, and that's why they're using abbreviations. And you probably want to jot down like a little mini outline on the scratch paper uh, standard of care okay so that's the next issue is what the standard of care is meaning how H must ex exercise his duty so H is homeowner the court determines the appropriate standard of care while the standard of care might be adjusted based on such things as physical conditions or professional occupations the court doesn't consider mental or emotional individual characteristics in setting the standard of care. In this case, P will claim that H owed a duty of, reasonable, of a reasonable person in his circumstances, meaning the reasonable care of a handgun owner. H may claim that he owes less of a duty because for some reason he is particularly afraid of people breaking into his home. However, this argument will fail because the court does not consider mental or emotional individual characteristics in setting the duty of care. It does not appear that there are any particular physical characteristics of H that alter the standard of care, or that he was a professional or a child, in which case the standard of care would be higher or lower. Therefore, the standard of care is a reasonable handgun owner. It should be noted that H is a landowner. The issue of landowner liability do not apply to H in this case because the injury was not to a person on his land, but rather to another person, P. Negligence per se. P may further attempt to invoke the doctrine of negligence per se. Negligence per se is a doctrine that allows the court to substitute the standard of care with the words of a statute. Where the defendant has violated the statute, it is sufficient to prove breach of duty. The plaintiff must still prove the three other elements of negligence, actual causation, proximate causation, and damages. In order for negligence per se to apply, the plaintiff must prove that one, her harm was the type of harm that the statute was designed to protect, and that she was in the class of persons the statute was designed to protect. In this case, P will try to apply the statute that provides that all firearms must be stored in a secure container that is fully enclosed and locked. She will claim that this is the standard of care. <clears throat> As for the first requirement, P will argue their harm is the types the statute was designed to protect because it was designed to protect people from being injured by handguns. She was injured by a handgun. The court will likely agree. However, as for the second requirement, H will argue that P was not in the class of persons because the requirement that handguns be stored in a secure container seems to protect children in the home. It does not seem to protect people who will be harmed by guns that are stolen because if that were the case, the requirement might be that guns be kept in a hidden location or that they must be kept in rooms with locked doors, but not necessarily in secure containers. He will argue that the statute is broader and legislative intent 
may show that it was designed to protect all people who might be injured by guns. The court will likely argue with P and that she was in the class. Therefore, the standard of care will be the statute and H will have breached. P must still prove the other elements of negligence. However, if the court finds that the statute does not protect P, P will need to prove breach. Breach. Breach determines whether the defendant met the standard of care as established above. The standard of care in this case is the care of a reasonable handgun owner. P will claim that H breached this duty because he kept a handgun on his dresser by his bed and a reasonable handgun owner would be aware of the risks in doing that and put it somewhere secure. Guys, I'm kind of running out of time, so if you want to read this off yourself, you can. Um, but if you if you want to look at it, they talk about part of the rule, the issue. They do an analysis, and then they write a conclusion. They don't go straight to a conclusion. They break it apart and they show bit by bit. Now I want to scroll through here and see if they show assault or battery, because that is part of the fact pattern, as well as the negligence. Okay. So I'm going to kind of scroll through here, and if you want to watch it over and over, pause it and look at what it says and read the whole thing off. So they have the actual cause. I don't know why they're writing a causation. They can just write actual cause. Causation is actual cause and uh, proximate cause, but they're, they're writing it, you know, I guess each person, um, they, they, they say he will argue this and, it says the court's likely to find H's argument tenuous and find that H's breach was but for cause. Now here's the proximate cause. The next issue is whether H's breach was the proximate cause. This is likely to be H's strongest argument. Proximate cause determines whether it was foreseeable that the harm would could and whether it would be fair to hold H liable. Yeah, because proximate cause is like the legal cause. Um... It's it's the for policy reasons that that they're going to hold them liable. Um, so in this case, H will argue that it wasn't foreseeable. And then I'm going to scroll through here, and I'm just going to look at the conclusion. Therefore, the court will likely agree H and not find proximate cause. That's kind of funny because look. Um, she made B mad, and he was going to shoot her for that reason. If she handed her purse over, he would not have taken out her gun, the gun. So right here, um, well, maybe they'll talk about that in the other section. I don't know. Damages. However, if P were to succeed showing proximate cause, she would need to show damages. Um... In this case, you claim that the damages were shock she suffered, the concussion, and perhaps any emotional damages. Shock and emotional damages are the same thing. Damages must be foreseeable, certain, unavoidable, and caused directly by the defendant's action. Foreseeability of peace harm is discussed above. Again, I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm just going to do little snippets and scroll through. If you want to pause it, and read it off yourself you can okay so it says causation is discussed above conclusion therefore the court will likely find that there was no negligence on the part of H because there was no proximate causation so they're saying it's the but for cause but it's not the legal cause or the proximate cause defenses in negligence if negligence is found H may assert defenses now contributory negligence is mostly abolished. However, if the jurisdiction retains it, the defendant argues that if the plaintiff is, well, you know what that is. Okay, so on these facts, P was likely not negligent, so there was no contributory negligence. Comparative negligence, is that it? The percentage of her negligence, assumption of the risk. The defense requires the assumption of the known risk, this would depend on whether P knew 
it was a dangerous area. It would also depend on whether she knew that B might be armed. It's unclear whether she knew these facts. Okay, now here's a uh, patron, or whatever her name was, and burglar. P may bring various actions against B. It's important to first note that B may be guilty of several criminal acts, but these are not causes upon which P may bring an action for damages. Assault. Assault is the intentional placing of a, a plaintiff in fear of imminent battery plus causation and damages. I don't know if I like that definition, but intent. Intent is desire or su substantial certainty to cause a result. In this case, P will argue that B intended to place P in fear because he said, I'm going to shoot you. He might have done it intending to frighten her into giving over his purse, but at least should have caused, should have known it would cause fear. Now, they're not putting in here the reasonable person standard, um, you know, it's not exactly perfect, but hey, this is a good example. Fear of imminent battery. Battery, see, battery is the harmful, unconsented touching. By the way, when you read these over, <clears throat> If you have any question over what the other person wrote or how they characterized their rule <clears throat> or if it, it you, because sometimes these aren't perfect and they're close enough you know what I'm saying because this is good enough see I I say cause actual cause um, causation you know but anyway so uh, if you want to read the whole thing I'm just going through it slowly, and I'm also commenting. Damages. As discussed above, P will claim her damages are concussion, distress, yada, yada. Conclusion. P will succeed in proving assault. Okay. And then battery. Battery is the unconsented. Battery is an unconsented harmful and or offensive touching harmful offenses to the reasonable person. Now she's talking about the reasonable person. Or he. Um... Actually, um, you can look at what they wrote, but this is this is a passing answer. And oh, look, they put intentional infliction of emotional distress. That's another um, intentional tort. We haven't really discussed that too much. N now um, it says intentional infliction of emotional distress requires extreme or outrageous conduct, intentionally or recklessly caused that in fact causes extreme emotional distress and then they go into that intent emotional distress again I'm not going to read word for word I'm going to kind of scroll through and see what they spotted and maybe their conclusion in little nuggets so conversion trespass to chattel conversion is an intentional extreme interference with the plaintiff's property be intended to take their purse P will argue this applies because B stole her purse and took it away, which had many valuable in it. See, there's no S at the end of that. I mean, this is just like, you can make some grammatical answers. This is a very good answer. Uh, it's good, so good they have it as a model answer. Trespass to Chattel, um, blah, blah, blah. False imprisonment. False imprisonment is intentionally holding a plaintiff captive and preventing her from escaping. This occurs when there's no reasonable means of escape. P will argue that in the brief time she was held at gunpoint, she was falsely imprisoned. A plaintiff may need to be held for only a second. He need not physically tie her up. Merely holding at gunpoint is sufficient. B may argue that P provoked him and made him mad. But this is no defense to this intentional tort. Therefore, P will likely succeed on this charge. Negligence. Negligence doesn't apply because, as discussed, B's act was intentional. Defenses. It's unlikely any defenses will apply. Uh, P versus C Cinema C. P may have a suit against Cinema for negligence. There's five elements to negligence, as discussed above. Duty. Um, 
You know, they talk about um, duty defined above, as some landowners owe higher duties. Um, the modern trend is a duty of reasonable care under the circumstances. Under the traditional rules, duty depends on what kind of individuals on the land. No duty is owed to an undiscovered trespasser. A slightly higher duty is owed to a known trespasser and a higher duty to a person on the land for social purposes. The highest duty is owed to someone known as an invitee who is on the land for profit. In this case, the court will find that P was an invitee because she was there to see a movie and therefore the, a business purpose. The parking lot belonged to cinema, so cinema was the landowner and owed a duty to P as an invitee. A landowner owes a duty to an invitee to inspect for dangerous circumstances and make them safe or warn the invitees. Additionally, applying either the Cardozo's or Andrew's test, P was in the zone of danger. The parking lot, and she was a foreseeable plaintiff. Breach. Breach is defined above. In this case, P will argue that C's failure to protect the customers was a breach. P will argue that C should have installed lighting, security guards, or some sort of a fence to protect the premises. It could have also warned patrons so that if P had known she could have been more on her guard walking through the lot, she might not have refused to give over her purse. Therefore, there was a breach. Actual causation. Okay, I'm not going to read this off. Um, but it does say defined above. You can you can write that or write supra. And there's, boy, one, two, three paragraphs below that section. Damages, analysis, same as above. Defenses. Okay, so they finished that off kind of anticlimactic. Now, this person's writing their stuff out. Patron versus homeowner. Negligence. Keeping the handgun beside the bed. This is more the style of how I write. Um, I'd rather just use less words and then write them out because I find the uh, P, the, the initials kind of confusing. And But you can't get as much stuff in and you have to choose your words a little more wisely when you write like this. So, and she, they don't have the definition in here for negligence. But they're running an introduction, so they're saying patron will contend that the homeowner was negligent in failing to keep his handgun in a secured, locked container as directed by the statute. In order to prevail in an action for negligence, patron must prove that homeowner owed him a duty, that he breached the duty, and that his breach caused the patron's injury, and that he suffered damages. So... I, don't, I just like this style of writing better, but I mean, they're both winning answers. Duty. Under the Cardoza view, a duty is owed only to foreseeable plaintiffs. Under the Andrews view, view a duty is owed to the whole world. In this case, Patron will argue that it was foreseeable that a thief could steal an unsecured handgun and use it to perpetuate the crime such as robbery. Negligence per se, violation of the statute. Okay, we're not going to go into that. Um, if you want to pause it and look at it, be my guest. Um, okay, a reasonable person would have secured the gun. They talk about the reasonable person, and then they talk about the breach. Homeowner kept a gun on his bedside table. There is no indication that the gun was kept in a locked drawer, but rather out on his table. Therefore, he violated the statute. Causation, but for cause. Homeowner's act of leaving the gun on the table was a but for cause. And they, they're not underlining the proximate and but for, but it's right in there. If he kept the lock in a locked container, burglar would not have access to it. Proximate cause. The homeowner will argue that the burglar's intervening criminal acts of breaking into his house and then robbing patron were superseding causes of the patron's injury. 
However, an intervening act by a criminal will not interrupt the causal chain if it is foreseeable. As discussed above, it was foreseeable that a criminal could break into the house and use the gun on another unsuspecting victim. Therefore, homeowner's argument will fail. Damages. Patron suffered shock and a concussion as a result of burglars robbing him sick. Now, that's funny because um, I thought Patron was a girl. But I guess a guy can have a purse, too. Therefore, if... Or maybe, maybe they're non-binary. Okay, so therefore, if burglar act is a foreseeable result of homeowner's negligence in failing to secure his handgun, homeowner can be liable for patron's injury. And so on and so forth. So here we go, you know, and then it's this assault. The prima facie case for assault is met when the defendant, one, performs an act that places the plaintiff in reasonable apprehension of imminent harmful or offensive contact with the person with his person the defendant had the intent to place the plaintiff in apprehension and causation there must be some physical conduct not mere words to constitute assault now i like this definition of assault better than the one we saw on the other example and I didn't, I, I mentioned something about that. Okay, and here, here burglar drew his handgun and stated, you made me mad, so now I'm going to shoot you. His words combined with pointing the gun at patron created in patron an apprehension that burglar was going to immediately shoot her. Further, burglar had the intent to make patron believe he was going to shoot, shoot her. This caused patron to faint and suffer a concussion. Therefore, burglar can be held liable for assault. Battery. Battery consists of a harmful offensive contact with the plaintiff's person intent by the defendant cause to cause the touching causation. Now, do you see how this can be tricky? We've talked about a person uh, having transferred intent for the battery We've talked about how assault doesn't have to be merely wor words and that there's two kinds. This is why I chose this one. It's a very good example of what we went over. The other uh, areas, the negligence was a ways back. But here, burglar intentionally took the purse, okay, from patrons, a patent's person, after she fainted isn't that interesting at the top it said he and over here it says she so i think they that was a typo they forgot to put the s in anyway taking an object from someone's person satisfies the offensive touching element okay so he didn't intend to have her faint and hit her head he intended to get the money right and to intimidate her and put her in fear. So the burglar seized her purse does not negate the offensiveness of the touching he caused. Therefore, he can be liable for burglary. Uh, she forgot to... Um, well, w what I would do with this is... I guess the order you go in is kind of hard. Uh, but, you know, this, this is a very good answer to me trespass to chattels okay so when you take the purse away that's trespass to chattels uh this occurs when the defendant interferes with the plaintiff's possession of, to her chattel that had intent of performing the act that interferes with the possession causes the interference and the plaintiff suffers damages here burglar grabbed patron's purse and ran away with it interfering with her right to possess it he did so intentionally. The police later apprehended Burglar. If he still had the purse that was returned to Patron, she may recover for any damages resulted from her temporary loss of possess possession. Cause conversion. Conversion occurs when the defendant interferes with the plaintiff's possession of her chattel, and the interference is so extensive as to warrant payment 
for the full value of the chattel. Two, has the intent of performing an act that interferes with the possession, causes the interference when the defendant's act amounts to an exercise of dominion and control over the chattel. Conversion is more likely to be found. Here, burglar sees the purse with the intent to completely and permanently deprive patron of possession. If burglar later apprehension if burglar's later apprehension by the police restored the purse to patron's possession, she may not be able to obtain the full value. If, however, burglar dispossessed disposed of the purse before he was apprehended, patron can recover the full value of the purse and its contents at the time burglar seized it. Now, you guys, you got to know this. This is, you know, ideally they can. Yes, they would probably be awarded damages. But if burglar is running around stealing purses, you know, you can't bleed a stone. But yes, yeah, she might be awarded cost in this instance. So it's, it's a really good example. Intentional infliction of emotional distress. I-I-E-D occurs when the defendant engages by the way I'm adding in my own two cents here and then reading parts but not the whole thing you can read along or you can read you know just it's up to you what you want to do intentional infliction of emotional distress occurs when the defendant one engages in extreme and outrageous conduct with the intent to cause severe emotional distress or is reckless as to the likelihood of causing dis severe distress causation and damages severe emotional distress burglar's conduct in pointing the gun at patron demanding her purse and stating that he was going to shoot her is conduct beyond all bounds of decency in a civilized society theft and threats to inflict serious bodily injury are extreme and intolerable burglar clearly intended to cause I like the way they say clearly <laughs> <coughs> oh excuse me anyway so therefore she can pre prevail under this theory now again I, I didn't read the whole thing now they also put an NIED negligent infliction of emotional distress okay suffered physical harm shock concussion and then she goes into she a patron in cinema. I'm just going to go through this kind of slowly, but I'm not going to talk that much. I want to get off because uh, uh, I don't want to have to use my inhaler again. But I've got to get running. It's late here, so basically, uh, this is similar to the other one. Duty to make safe for invitees. Um, they talk about the same thing. Negligence. Uh, lack of lights, but for cause, same, same, proximate cause, joint and several liability. So this is going to be about, um, plaintiff can recover full amount of da any damages proximately caused by the combined torturous act of two or more defendants, whether acting independently or in concert that result in a single indivisible harm and then they go on about that so okay so that that was the where they stopped on theirs and um, are they perfect no but this is the kind of thing you want to do you want to read what other law graduate students uh, trying to get their license to practice law, wrote after studying for the bar, and uh, these model answers. So I can scroll back up to the actual question, and then I'm going to thank you for watching. I'm going to wish you good luck if that's what you're practicing for. Even if you're just taking essays at school, um, I would most schools have the exams, uh, past exams that professors used, sort of like in a bank. Uh, 
um, in their library a lot of times and you can look at them but usually they not, they're not as sophisticated as these bar questions that use multiple issues and this is really you know something that is very tight <clears throat> and concise but it raises a lot of issues it raises a lot of questions and it touches a lot of areas to see how much of the law you know. It's testing for negligence. It's trusting, testing for, you know, landowner, trespasser, invitee, um, their liability. It's testing for, you know, um, a homeowner. And, uh, you know, this is a crime, but it's also a tort right so uh oh thanks for stopping by i hope hope you have good luck with your studies and take care bye